Psalm 95 is all about, oh, let us come and worship. Let us come and worship. Usually when we talk about worship, we go to a New Testament passage. We often use passages like John 4, 23 and 24 to talk about worship. And I understand why we do that. Uh, Those are great passages to use, and they are passages that are in the New Testament. And so they're closer to the day and age in which we live. And as we think about that text, that's a great text, we'll make reference to it tonight. But we have to understand that men have been worshiping God for thousands of years. And God has required at least some of the same things in all ages of those that worshiped Him. There may be individual things that have changed, but worshiping God in the sense that He is the object of that worship, that there is a pattern for that worship, there are certain ingredients to that worship, that that has not changed. It's always been true. So there's a great deal that we can learn about worship from Psalm 95. We'll try to look at that tonight. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, of worship, he said, "In what greater calamity can fall upon a nation than the loss of worship?" And I think you will agree that that is a great calamity uh, that has, in many respects, fallen upon our nation is the loss of worship. It used to be the case that on Sundays you knew what the majority of people would be doing; they would be going somewhere to worship. Their worship might or not might not have been true worship. It might not have been what it should have been. But nonetheless, that was a day that they had set aside to go and to at least acknowledge God. To at least acknowledge that there was a God. To at least acknowledge that that God was deserving of honor and adoration. But more and more, our nation is becoming like so many of the nations around the world where worship is not a national thing anymore. On any given Sunday, as you get up and you get ready and you begin to make your way to the church building, you'll see more and more of your neighbors with their cars still in their driveways. They are not going anywhere. They consider Sunday to be just another day. Maybe as you make your way to the service of the church, you'll find... Uh, campers being pulled behind vehicles, you'll find boats being pulled behind vehicles, Uh, you'll find golf carts, you'll find four-wheelers, you'll find any number of things that suggest that those individuals are going to spend the day doing something other than worshiping God. Those things may or may not be wrong in and of themselves other than the fact uh, that they are doing them on the first day of the week when they ought to be in worship of God. And so our nation is more and more becoming a nation uh, that uh, does not worship. And that shows, of course, the dark days uh, that we're in. In Psalm 95, as we look at this psalm, and we look at God's people in the Old Testament, we know that the nation was Israel. Israel was a religious nation, and Israel was a nation that worshipped. Uh, Their worship was not always what it needed to be. There were corruptions of that worship. God at times punished them for those corruptions. But they were, by and large, a worshiping people. And so it is not surprising that as we read Psalm 95, we consider this national psalm uh, that we will find that it is about worship. And it is about coming to worship. You may want to notice some passages. Notice how verse 1 begins. Oh, come. Notice verse 2, let us come. Verse 6, O come. They were not only a nation that worshipped, but they were a nation that invited those around them to worship. We know that the church is supposed to be like that. We know that in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, many people shall go and say, come ye. Israel was a nation that worshipped and they were a nation that invited others to worship their God. We as well today ought to be people who worship and we ought to invite others to come and to worship the God uh, that we serve. And so Psalm 95 is an invitation to come and worship God. But it's much more than just an invitation to worship God. If you are going to worship God, you're going to have to remember certain things. You're going to have to do certain things in order for that worship to be acceptable. And Psalm 95 will lay out some of those things Uh, for you. As we look at this psalm, we'll see the aim of worship. We'll see the action of worship. 
We'll see the attitude of worship and we'll see the authority of worship. We'll begin with the aim of worship. Notice as we look at the psalm, beginning in verse 1, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Notice the aim of worship. The aim of worship is unto the Lord. We're singing unto the Lord. Now it is true that there is an aspect of singing according to the New Testament, Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19, that is teaching and admonishing one another. That's something that takes place in our singing, and that deals with the reciprocal action of singing. Congregational singing is the pattern that we're given in the New Testament. Not choral singing, not a chorus singing to an audience, but rather a congregation singing. Remember, singing one to another, singing in unison. That's the idea of Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. But there is teaching and admonishing that is naturally a part of that singing. And if you're not singing, then you're not teaching. If you're not singing, then you're not admonishing. Others may be teaching you, others may be admonishing you, but you're not fulfilling your responsibility to them. It's a one-sided thing, and it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be teaching and admonishing one another. Um, It is supposed to be us meeting one another's needs in that process. But sometimes we forget in singing that the ultimate design of singing is to sing unto the Lord, as this passage here suggests. That, that's the byproduct of our singing is the fact that we get something out of it also. But it begins by us giving in it what we ought to give in it, and that is glory and honor to God. We sing unto the Lord. Now, as we think about the aim of worship today, if we were to ask people, the average person, who do you worship, they very likely would say, well, we worship God. That's who we worship. But then if you were to examine your worship, you'll see that their worship is geared toward pleasing, satisfying the worshiper. And so they may say that the aim of their worship is God, but in everything that they do, they are saying by that that the aim of their worship is to please the worshiper. Some of them even will ask what individuals want in worship, and then they will do their best to try to come up with a recipe that then would please those worshipers. That is the whole philosophy, of course, behind the community church. It is the idea of providing a church that would be pleasing to a large number of that community. And so they take that which is generally accepted and they put it all together and they present a worship that will be pleasing to a large number of people. But worship isn't about pleasing the worshiper. Worship is about pleasing God. It's about giving Him honor and glory. How much of worship today is directed at the worshiper? Let me try to explain some of how that's done. Uh, That that involves the use of mechanical instruments and music because people like the music. Uh, That involves the, the choruses because people like to hear individuals that are really good at singing. Uh, that involves so many of those things that are geared toward the worshiper. It also involves this whole idea of clapping and applause and other things because it's the worshiper that finds what they're looking for in that. And so they respond in kind. We like it. We appreciate it. Thank you for that. And so it's geared toward that. I've even heard, and perhaps you've heard this too, Uh, of those that are a part of singing groups will get up, whether it be at a Christian camp or something else, and and they they kind of reveal, maybe more than what they mean to reveal by what they say, but they'll say, for example, we want to sing praises to God. Okay? And then later on in in continuing that discussion, they'll say, uh, we hope that it's entertaining to you. And so we've got to keep in mind that our purpose is is not to be entertaining. That's not what our goal is and what we do. Good singing, I take it, is pleasing. I think we like it, and I I think it makes us feel good. I'm not against that. I don't think we're supposed to leave feeling feeling depressed or sad. or I, I don't think that's the case. But the concern is when we begin to try to please the worshiper, 
And that takes precedence over pleasing the one who is to be worshipped, the aim of our worship. We've always got to keep in mind who the aim of worship is. So verse 1 says, it is unto the Lord. But notice as well in verse 1, the latter part of the verse, it says, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Notice who we're making this joyful noise to. That better describes what I do than singing in the first part of the verse. But the joyful noise is to the rock of our salvation. It's being directed to Him. He's the one that we're trying to honor. He's the one that's getting the glory of this. Notice in verse 2, it says, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him. Notice He's the aim. Our worship is being directed toward Him. Now John chapter 4 Verses 23 and 24, which is uh, the parallel New New Testament passage, uh, says this, The hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You see, the focus of worship, the aim of worship is to God. It isn't to the worshiper, it is to the one being worshipped. It is to God that our worship is to be aimed. It's directed at Him. Do you remember what Jesus told the devil? The, the devil was tempting Jesus, and he promised to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the wor- world if he would fall down and worship Him. Do you remember how Jesus responded? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou worship. God is to be the aim of worship. You're not to be the aim of worship. You're trying to get me to direct my worship to you. But my worship is not to be directed to you. My worship is to be directed to God. And notice what Jesus is saying. No matter what you give me, my worship is not to be directed to you. But why do you think that groups today gear their worship toward the worshiper? Why why do you think the incentive of that is? Why would you pattern your worship in such a way as to please the worshiper? What do you get out of that? Okay, they get immediate gratification. You get that, right? People like that, right? There are people who choose a career because they like that. They like to hear that. There are, there are people who work jobs but who do certain things on the weekend because they like that, right? Nothing wrong with liking that, but in a religious setting, that's what your goal is to hear that, then you understand one of the motives for giving people what they want. Not necessarily what they need, but what they want. But what's another another motive for doing that? Okay? More people, right? If you're concerned with numbers... You get bigger numbers doing that. Your worship is boring. I want to to worship where they've got a band. I want to hear all of these instruments. I I, want to worship that involves this and involves this and involves this. Your worship's too traditional. Your worship's too boring. I don't want that. So if you want to draw larger crowds of people, then you've got to appeal to what people want. So you do that. That's another incentive. But let's think about even more motives for doing this. More people, generally speaking, means what? More money. money. That comes hand in hand too, doesn't it? And so you understand what some of the motives are for this. Now you understand why even some congregations of the Lord's people are willing to tone down the preaching. You understand why... Uh, Even those within the Lord's church jazz up the singing. Now you understand why other concessions and other things are done because they want this and they want the numbers and they want the money and the funds and the acceptance and the other things that come with that. They want to compete. But when we do those things, what ultimately have we forgotten? The aim of worship. We've forgotten God. We're here to worship Him. And really, we're here to worship Him if nobody else wants to do it. 
My worship has got to be directed toward Him, not toward this. My preaching is directed toward you in the sense that I'm trying to teach you, I'm trying to instruct you, but ultimately I'm trying to please Him. I'm trying to preach the preaching that He bids me to do. And so, I'm not just going to preach smooth things because that will make you like me or, or that will make you tolerate me or, or that won't upset anyone. Ultimately, I'm preaching the preaching that He bids me. What He tells me in His Word that men need. Do you understand the motive? But let's go on down through the context. I think you'll see some more uh, that's involved in this. Notice as we think about the aim of worship that this psalm is going to deal with who God is. We can't ever forget who God is. Notice it says in verse 1 that He is the rock of our salvation. What do you think about when you think about a rock? Okay. Heavy, not easily moved, solid, foundational. You even think about the insurance company, right? The investment company, Prudential. Like a what? Chevrolet, like a rock, right? All these things. That the whole idea is something stable, something you can build on, something that's not easily moved, something that doesn't shift about. And so God's the rock. But even when you think in Bible terms, you even think about the water that came from the rock, the provision that the rock gave in the Old Testament. So we worship God because He's the rock. We worship Him because He's the rock of our salvation. Literally, He is the groundwork for our salvation. We have salvation because of Him. But notice as we continue in verse 3, we worship God for the Lord is a great God. We worship a big God. We worship a God who's great in love, who's great in mercy, who's great in patience, who's great in holiness, who's great in all of these things. He doesn't just barely measure up in those things. He's great in those things. In fact, the rest of the verse says this, and a great king above all gods. Not only is he a great God, but he is a God that's greater than all gods. You put all the other gods together, they don't measure up to Him. Well, we see that in Egypt with Him overcoming the gods of Egypt. But notice as well as we look at this, verses 4 and 5, this is something I missed at first. I think it's a beautiful thought. It says, In His hands are the deep places of the earth, and the strength of the hills is His also. Think about what's being pictured there. The deep places of the earth. Literally the gorges, the recesses of the earth. And then we have the tops of the mountains. If I'm on the top of the mountain, if it's a mountaintop experience in my life, guess who's there? God. I'm in His hands there. But what if I'm in the valley of despair? What, what if I'm in the deep recesses, caves of the earth? I'm still in God's hands there. God's with me if everything in my life is falling apart, or God's with me if everything in my life is going right. Both ways, I'm in His hands. That's why I worship Him, because He isn't a God who just is there with me in the good times. He's a God that's there with me in the worst of times. Whether I'm on the mountaintop or I'm in the valleys, I'm in His hands. Notice it says in verse 5, The sea is His, and He made it. And his hands formed the dry, dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Our Maker. He's the rock. He's the great God. He's the God above all gods. He's the Maker. He's all of these things. That's why he's deserving of worship. It's amazing to me that we live in a day and age where men worship the creation but not the Creator. How much talk do we have about going green, being green? I have no problem with being green. I have no problem with doing our best to preserve our planet. We ought to do that. We ought to make wise use of the resources that we have. But there's no question in my mind that there is a portion of our country that literally worships the creation.
And they're the same portion of our population that could care less about the Creator. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, they, they don't. A tree's not demanding anything of them, but the Creator is, and that, that's the point. Where else do we read about that type of thing taking place? Romans one, right? They worship and served the creation more than the Creator. Do you know anything about Romans one and what was going on there? It was the best of times or the worst of times? Worst of times. God gave them up. Because they gave Him up. They gave Him up because they wanted to work their unrighteousness. They didn't want anyone telling them what to do. Do we not live in a day and age where people don't like anyone telling them what to do? Don't tell me what to do. We hear that all the time. Whether it's a child in school, whether it's someone on the job, uh, whether it's just someone in society, don't tell me what to do. It's in religious circles too, right? Don't tell me what to do. Don't, don't get up there and preach on, don't tell me what to do. I don't want you to tell me what to do. Well, it, 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 it's simple, symptomatic of what we have in Romans chapter 1. But even if we go back in the Old Testament, do you know who Baal was? He was what? The rain god, right? Many of these idols in the Old Testament, they were just representations of the natural material creation that people worship. Nature worship and this whole idea, it goes back all the way through the Old Testament. We're sophisticated, aren't we? We're really sophisticated. Technology has come a long way. But you know, the superstitions of the past are very much alive and well today. You look at the New Age movement, that's not, there's nothing new about it. It's just the old superstition of the past, the old false teachings of the past being revived. It's not new. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. This fascination with the earth and this worshiping of, it's not nothing new. Throughout the Old Testament, they worship the stars. Throughout the Old Testament, they worship the creation. Nothing new. It's just we, we've, <laughs> we're going right back through the same things that they did. And so it very much applies to us today. But think about something else as we think about the aim of our worship. Notice it says, and, and I think this, this is the point that I'm driving at. I hope you get the point. And that is, in a day and age in which so many people seem to be so fascinated by the natural creation, by going green and all of this. What a perfect opportunity for us, if we will, to tell them about the one that made this green earth. To tell them about the one that designed it in the beginning. To tell them about the home that He built for us. They need to know about that. They need to understand that we're stewards of this earth. And we, we've got to lead in to talk to them about that because of their attitudes. And perhaps we can bring them around to seeing the Creator, seeing more than just the creation. Psalm 95 and verse 7 says, He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. So this is another picture of God and why we ought to worship Him because He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. He cares for us. Sheep are helpless animals. They need the shepherd to provide food and water, protection. God provides all of that for us. That's the aim of worship. This is what John MacArthur has written. I thought it was interesting. He says, The church has slipped into a philosophy of Christian humanism that is flawed with self-love, self-esteem, self-fulfillment, and self-glory. There appears to be scant concern about worshiping our glorious God on His terms. If the bulletin didn't say worship service, maybe we wouldn't know what we are supposed to be doing. And I think that there are a lot of religious services that uh, don't appear anything like a worship service. We wouldn't recognize that's even what's going on 
by what's being done. Let's talk about the action of worship. Uh, the Greek word for worship is proskuneo. It is the idea of prostrating oneself before God, bowing down. That's the action of worship. Psalm 95 and verse 2 says, let us come before His presence. There is an action involved in that. Now, there, there's a false idea out there that all of life is worship. The reason why that doctrine is taught is because if you can make all of life worship, then you can make everything in life a part of worship. And the goal is to get everything into worship. And so, if you claim that all of life is worship, then suddenly everything that goes on in life now is worship and gets included in worship. Which is foolishness, obviously, just on the surface. It's foolishness to think that everything that we do day in and day out is, is, is worship. Is that her foolishness? Uh, changing a baby's diaper now is worship. It's worship because it's something we do in life. Carrying out the garbage, that's worship. Something we do. In, you see how foolish? That's foolish. We understand that. But what this psalm is trying to teach us is that worship is something that we enter into. It's a decision that we make to do something. You remember Abraham said, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Worship was what he was going to do over there. Worship was not what he was doing right here. He made the decision to enter into worship. We make the decision to enter into worship. We made the decision tonight. Uh, there is action involved in that decision. But notice as well, let us worship and bow down. That's literally the meaning of worship, bowing down. Psalm 95 and verse 6. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Again, that's the action of worship. Some people think about worship as, as a passive activity. L literally, you come and you sit on a pew and that's worship. That's not worship. Worship is praying and singing and engaging in the actions of worship. That's worshiping. If you just come and sit on a pew, you haven't worshipped. But how many people think about it that way? The person that's standing up here leading a prayer, he's not saying the prayer for you. He's leading you in prayer, but you're supposed to be praying with him. You're supposed to be following him, and when he mentions the sick, you have names that, not out loud, but names that you're plugging in as well, you're praying with him. The, the same is true, the person that's up here leading singing, he's the song leader. He's not singing for you, he's leading you in song, and you're supposed to be following him. You're supposed to be singing too. That's what's involved in worship. That's the action of worship. But now let's think about the attitude of worship. Notice some attitudes that are talked about. Notice the word joyful in verse 1 and the word joyful in verse 2. Notice as well in verse 2, we come before His presence with thanksgiving. There's two attitudes, joy and thanksgiving. Notice in verse 6 that we bow down, we kneel. There's reverence. There's another attitude that's involved in worship. Now, attitudes are important. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And as we worship in spirit, that deals with this attitude. But let's think about the authority of worship. Notice Psalm 95 and verse 7. The latter part of that verse says, Today, if you will do what? Hear His voice. Worship is all about hearing His voice. Worship is all about letting God speak to us through His Word, hearing His voice, obeying His will. That's what worship is about. Now, this passage is talking about sheep. We're the, sh the people of His pasture. We're the sheep of His hand. Do you remember what the Good Shepherd Jesus said about the sheep? They hear what? They hear My voice and they do what? They follow Me. That's what worship is. Worship is hearing His voice and following Him. If you gather, as we're gathered here tonight, but when you gather, you do what you want to do, rather than what He wants you to do, who have you really worshipped? If you're doing what you want to do, who are you worshipping? You're worshipping yourself. You're not worshipping Him. You see, you worship Him by doing what He has told you to do. If you come and do what you want to do, you're, you're not worshipping Him. You're worshipping yourself. We sometimes use the illustration, the father... Uh, that dies, he's left a plan uh, for his sons. He wants the barn built here. He wants the house built here. He wants the pond over here. The sons look at all of this and they say, that would be a good place for the barn. That would be a good place for the house. But I don't understand why he wants the pond over here. 
what we're going to do is we'll build the barn there and we'll build the house there, but we're going to put the pond over here between the house and the barn. We think that's a better place. Did they obey their father? You say, well, yes, they did. They did two of the three things he wanted them to do. They built the barn we wanted, the house we wanted. But did they obey him? If you do two of the three things he asked you to do, did you obey him? No, you really didn't obey him at all. Because that's what you wanted to do anyway. That's where you wanted the barn. That's where you wanted the house. Had you wanted them somewhere else, what would you have done? You would have put them somewhere else. You just did what you wanted to do. It wasn't about what he wanted at all. You just happened to agree with him on those points. The same is true of people who come together and they do some of the things that God requires in worship. Why do they do those things? Because they agree with God on that. Why do they change the things that they, they change? Because they don't like what God has said. Who are they worshiping when they do that? You say, well, four of the five acts that they do are what God said to do, and so they're worshiping God. No, they're not. They're worshiping themselves, because those are things they want to do anyway. They're not doing them because God commanded them. They're doing them because they like them and because they happen to agree with God on those things. Notice in verse 10 that he says, They have not known my ways. Here were those who had not known his ways, who were not following or obeying his will. And so we've taken a look at worship. We've seen the aim of worship. We've seen the action of worship. We've seen the attitude of worship. And we've seen the authority of worship. It's from an Old Testament text, but it has great application even in our day and age today. Thank you for your attention tonight.